Welcome to the Museum of the American Revolution's third Carl M. Buckles Memorial Lecture. I'm Scott Stevenson, President and CEO of the museum. This is our first virtual edition of the Buckles Lecture, and we are so excited. We have more than a thousand people from across the country registered for tonight's event. People from Seattle to Southern California to Southern Florida to uh, Maine and everywhere in between. So it's a virtual gathering of people from across the nation in I think a very significant time to re be reflecting on the themes of uh, tonight's discussion with Professor Annette Gordon-Reed. Now, please feel free as many of you already have started to use that chat function in the Zoom in order to say hello to us, tell us where you're watching from, and most important, send your questions in throughout the program. We're gonna to try to get to as many of those as we can uh, at the end of the lecture this evening, and we wanna make this as, uh, as interactive as possible. Now, this is normally a ticketed event at the museum, and tonight's lecture is virtual and free thanks to the generosity of several members of our board of directors. And so we're very grateful to recognize our chairman, Morris Offit, who's watching tonight, as is our vice chair, Martha McGeary Snyder here in Philadelphia, Karen Buckles, Stephen Schwab in Chicago, whose support this evening is in memory of his aunts, Terry and Penny Schwab. Now, these are just the latest in a long line of friends and family who first established and now sustain the Buckholz Lecture. And we're so grateful to all of you, particularly those tuning in this evening. And more broadly, our work to ensure that the promise of the American Revolution endures depends on the ongoing support of our more than 5,000 members, Revolution Society and George Washington Council donors from across the nation, from all 50 states who uh, support us here at the museum. And thanks to many of you who are tuning in tonight. For those of you who are just becoming aware of the Museum of the American Revolution through the lecture this evening, we encourage you to check out our website, amrevmuseum.org. Consider become a becoming a member to uh, support the museum. And if you're so inspired this evening, or if you're like me, you, uh, you sometimes want to act immediately, we have a, we're experimenting this evening for the first time of allowing people to uh, text to give. And so if you text M-O-A-R for Museum of the American Revolution to uh, the number 44321, we will be very grateful to you and uh, every little bit counts, and particularly in these uh, difficult times that we're facing today. Now, Tonight's lecture honors our dear departed friend, Carl Buchholz, who served as vice chair of the museum's board of directors dur during our very critical early founding years. Uh, a very um, a time in the museum's history when it wasn't sure we'd ever be able to actually rise out of the ground and open the museum here at Third and Chestnut Streets in Philadelphia. Now, we are so blessed today to count among our board members, uh, Carl's wife, Karen, who herself is a incredible star and a leader in Philadelphia's corporate and philanthropic community. And of course, she's here uh, this evening uh, tuning in as well. And the tradition in this amazing Buckholz family continues to the next generation. And so I'm so pleased to welcome Carl and Karen's daughter, Julia Buckholz, this evening. She's a senior, by the way, at the University of Pennsylvania, studying history, politics, and public policy. Uh, and Julia is here to join me to introduce our esteemed speaker, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed. So please, Julia, join me. Hi, thank you, Scott. Okay, so on behalf of the Buckholz family, I'd like to welcome you all to the third Carl Buckholz Memorial Lecture. I wanna start with a few thank yous. First, I'd like to thank Marguerite Lenfest and the late Jerry Lenfest. The Museum of the American Revolution, our virtual host tonight, would not exist without the vision, passion, and persistence of the Lenfests. My father loved you both and loved working with you to make the museum a reality, and your support continues to be vital to its success. I also want to thank Comcast and DLA Piper for their generous contributions once again to endow this lecture. 
for their steadfast support during my father's career and for ensuring that his legacy will continue to live through projects that were important to him. I'd also like to thank Martha Snyder and Stephen Schwab for co-chairing this event, board chair Morris Offit for his generous support and for the museum's work in making this event come to fruition. Lastly, I'd like to extend my gratitude to WURD 96.1 FM 900 AM. We are proud to partner with such a remarkable organization. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank our speaker, Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian Annette Gordon-Reed for joining us for what promises to be a fascinating and informative evening. We live in strange times to say the least. And while none of us are actually here in person, I know that my father would be pleased to see that so many people are in virtual attendance tonight. This lecture is a wonderful way to remember him and Professor Gordon Reed has, developed, has delved deeply into the values that were so meaningful to him. The importance of family and securing our place in the world, the critical role of history and helping us understand what comes next, and a dedication to the aspirations and hopes that are so essential to America's sense of itself and its future. My father would be so passionately invested in tonight's lecture. He was a dedicated student of history, particularly of the American Revolution, and as a graduate of the University of Virginia, he was also a devotee of Jeffersonian history. Professor Gordon Reed's scholarship has impacted not only the way we think about Mr. Jefferson, but also about history itself, particularly in, in the challenging centuries of mistaken assumptions by previous scholars in their investigations. For example, that white people tell the truth, black people lie, slave owners tell the truth, and slaves lie. In doing so, she mined a whole new vein of scholarship, or more precisely, she has championed a re-examination of American history in ways that finally give voice to the African-American families, slaves and free, who actually lived it. Professor Gordon Reed's compelling scholarship and perspective has brought us a collection of outstanding biographical portraits in books like Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, Vernon Ken Reed, Andrew Johnson, and of course, the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family, which won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for History, as well as 15 additional awards. She is one of the most accomplished scholars of our time. In 2010, she received the National Humanities Medal, the nation's highest honor for arts and humanities. That same year, Professor Gordon Reed or earned a MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the MacArthur Genius Award. She is a National Book Award winner, a recipient of the Frederick Douglass Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship recipient, and in 2019, she was elected a member of the American Philosophical Society, the oldest learned society in America, founded by Benjamin Franklin and headquartered about 100 yards from the museum on Chestnut Street here in Philadelphia. Earlier this summer, she was named a university professor, the very highest honor for a faculty member at Harvard University. In announcing her selection, the university said, she reminds us of the transformative power of academic discovery. Her achievements alone make her a very worthy candidate um, to lead the Carl Buckles lecture tonight. But at a time when our nation confronts issues of systemic racism and calls for social justice, Professor Gordon Reed's remarkable portrait of the troublesome history of Thomas Jefferson requires all of us to focus on the fact that American ideals have almost always clashed with American realities. Jefferson offers perhaps the very best example of this struggle. As Professor Gordon Reed wrote in a 2017 essay called Charlottesville, Why Jefferson Matters, the Jefferson of the Declaration of Independence, with its words proclaiming self-evident truths about the equality of mankind and the pursuit of happiness, has inspired people the world over. But there is still the Jefferson who enslaved people, and he has also said that Blacks and whites could not live together in harmony. This struggle between Jefferson's inspirational ideals and his own refusal to count African-American 
among those worthy to pursue and enjoy them lies at the heart of America's current reckoning on race relations. Or as Professor Gordon Reed wrote, perhaps coming fully to grips with the paradoxes that Jefferson's life presents is what being an American is all about. President Obama paraphrasing William Faulkner once said, the past isn't dead and buried. In fact, it isn't even past. More importantly by far is how we use the past to guide our lives today. In other words, how we get to a usable past. Few, if any, historians are as well equipped as Professor Annette Gordon-Reed to lead this effort. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this remarkable woman to Philadelphia. Thank you very, very much uh, for that generous introduction, Julia. I don't know what to say. Um, these, and I would like to thank your family for sponsoring this event and everyone who help make it possible. Um, these are indeed extraordinary times. It's an extraordinary way of doing this. We're getting used to this idea of speaking uh, into a camera uh, for an unseen audience. But I am looking forward to the questions that you will ask at the end of the evening, because that is always the best part of these kinds of things. You know, we are living in extraordinary times. Uh, over the past few months, I've been asked by a number of people have we seen this before? Julia mentioned wanting to have a usable past. People are interested in what happened before as a way of perhaps suggesting to us how we might handle our present and go forward into the future. And I've said over and over, well, I don't recall any time exactly like this. We have had a pandemic before. We think of the Spanish flu that comes to mind immediately. We've had times when the country was sharply riven by partisan concerns, certainly to the point that we actually had a civil war. I would hope we're not at that point. Uh, but we've also had moments of economic distress. What's interesting about this time is that all three of these things are happening at once, and we haven't figured out how to deal with them. This is brought to the fore a lot of questions about the American system, about the American system of government, um, voting, we're heading into an interesting, to say the least, election period. And as a scholar of the early American Republic, again, I'm often asked, you know, what do people make of this? What are we to make of this, given where we started and from where we are at this particular moment? Julia mentioned before the notion of a reckoning a reckoning about race in the country. And this is something that has been added to the mix here with the death of the killing of George Floyd that galvanized people all over the country, all over the world, actually. It's been an amazing thing to see the outpouring of concern about policing after that particular event. There was Ferguson, Trayvon Martin. There have been other instances before this and they didn't quite hit people in the same way. I've tried to figure out what was different about that situation compared to the other ones, um, why people had this particular response. I don't wonder if it's not that we have for many months been shut in uh, and sort of sheltering in place because of the pandemic. We've been wearing masks. We've been forced to think about ourselves as a community in ways that we don't typically do. And I don't wonder if that has not been a part of why people responded to that particular event in a sort of communal way that people thought of it, it had something to do with them and not was just some event that happened to other people in another place. But this reckoning that we've had with race is actually something that's been a long time making. I think this really got going in a very, very strong way with the events in Charleston some years ago when parishioners were killed by a white supremacist who was invited into the church. People welcomed him. They wanted him to pray with them. And nevertheless, he killed them. And we know that he was very, very much influenced by and had con Confederate flags and other kind of paraphernalia that identified him or that he identified 
as being part of a white supremacist movement. And these were the kinds of things that spurred him to action. And from that moment, there, even though there had been calls before for removing Confederate symbols from public spaces, the starkness of this event, people who had been kind to this young man, who wanted him to pray in the place where you think you would be safe, he nevertheless killed them. And people saw the connection between the iconography of the, of the Confederacy and his views and said, enough is enough. We should not have those kinds of symbols in the public, public square. I remember uh, I was asked a number of times how I felt about this, and I actually have written some things about it. People said that this is not, that this would be an erasure of history to do this, that this was a question of heritage, not hate. And on the other side, people said, no, the Confederates were defeated in battle. Their ideas about the future of America on the North American continent were defeated. Um, the institution of slavery was destroyed. Legalized slavery was destroyed by the Civil War. We should move on from that. And these symbols are, hate, are hurtful to Black people who live in towns. And you see these kinds of monuments to Confederate soldiers and the flag, things like that, were hurtful to them. And so these suicides clashed. And to my surprise, actually, uh, we began to see much more much more action on that front when people began to say, this is a time to change. As time went by, people moved from thinking about Confederates, and I had said, you know, I'd staked out a position, I should say at the beginning, saying, well, as a historian, I don't like the idea of pretending that things didn't exist or erasing the past, if that's the way people were putting it, I didn't think that it was necessary to remove everybody you know, who had anything to do with slavery. I was thinking mainly about the Confederates because there was an idea where people had actually been defeated. We had a war about this. And it was clear that to me that having those kinds of symbols not only were hurtful to black people, but they were sort of, in my view, an insult to the soldiers of the United States Army who had fought these people in battle. And the question became, well, how do you make a decision about who goes and who stays? And for me, it was clear that the Confederacy was separate from the founding generation. And I said so in an article that it was one thing to remove Confederate symbols and another thing to remove the symbols of members of the founding generation. And I actually didn't think that things would go so quickly to move to the point where people began to say, well, perhaps we should think about doing this, perhaps moving Jefferson and moving Washington and so forth, that these were not good symbols for a, an America that wanted to go forward as a multicultural nation. Jefferson wrote the American Declaration of Independence and the famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Everybody knows this. We we say these words and we celebrate these, words, celebrate these words on July 4th. And at the same time, he also, as Julia mentioned, did not believe that African-Americans and white people could live together in the United States as one people. In notes on the state of Virginia, he said that blacks and whites could not live together because blacks would never forgive whites for the things that had happened to them. He talks about a more, patri a more patrie that a slave person, an enslaved person, and slavery was racially based. He meant black people could not love a country where they had been enslaved. He also predicted that whites would never be able to give up their prejudices against black people. And for Jefferson, citizenship was a real thing. You could not have first class and second class citizenship citizens in a Republican society. And he did not think that, you, that blacks and whites could live with equal citizenship and equal power in this country. So there's the paradox. There's the conflict there between the words of the Declaration, <coughs> excuse me, and Jefferson's words and notes on the state of Virginia. So he's a problematic figure in that particular way. George Washington, was 
a president. He's considered the father of the country. He was described that way. Uh, there are many historians who believe that were it not for Washington, there would not have been a United States of America because the 13 colonies would not have rallied around another person so fervently as they did Washington. Washington became president and established the precedent, a precedent that we hope will continue, of the president leaving office uh, in a peaceful way, not trying to take power uh, to himself, more power than had been granted to him by the people of the United States of America, was seen as, in, as, seen as a, a pivotal figure in American history. Um, and at the same time, he, like Jefferson, enslaved people. So the question becomes, how do we, or can we honor a person who denied the right of freedom to hundreds of people at Mount Vernon, hundreds of people whom he owned, whom he bought and sold, some of whom he sold to the West Indies almost to certain death. Uh, how do you square those two people, those, those two uh, realities in one individual person? Now it's true that unlike Jefferson, Washington did free the enslaved people that he was able to free upon his death, but that's, that's sort of a, a, a dicey business there, you know, to use people, to enslave people while you're alive and then let them go when you're dead, uh, when you don't need them anymore. I'm happy that he did that, but that doesn't solve the problem of him being a, a person who enslaved other individuals. So you have these two people who for most of American history, there would have been no question whatsoever that we should honor them or that their, their lives should be commemorated in some way because with Washington, we owe the country, the existence of the country to him in some historians view and others view as well. And Jefferson wrote a creed for the United States of America. Whether he believed all of the things that he said personally, I actually think he did believe those things, but whether he did or not, he has given, he gave us something that we use. So how do you rid yourself of people who give you things that you are still using? How do you handle them? What is the best way to do it? I have been asked that a number of times. I actually consulted, I have consulted with people uh, about this question. When Yale was trying to decide what to do about Woodrow Wilson, a problematic person in many, many ways, uh, the question of whether or not he should be honored with, excuse me, with uh, Calhoun, uh, get to Princeton later on, John C. Calhoun, should he be honored by having a dorm named after him? You know, what, what should they do with this person who was a famous graduate, who was the architecture of the notion of slavery as a positive good? A person who said that the African race was destined to be enslaved. Uh, there's a letter that he writes, and actually uh, something that he writes to Alexander Dumas, the, uh, Dumas, the author of the, of the Three Musketeers, who was thinking about coming to the United States, and he basically tells him not to do it because he's part black and he would not be welcome there. Um, this is a person, you know, he doesn't, his views of, of race relations would not fit, we hope, in what we see as the American understanding about race relations today. So should he be honored that way? And the question was, how do you decide? Once you decide to remove him, what about other people? The slippery slope argument that people raise. And the decision was made that, and I think that this was right, that, that Calhoun should go. And part of the consideration is, number one, that what contribution did the person make to the country? Is he, are those contributions continuing? Have, uh, does this person symbolize things that we still stand for in some way? And in my view, Calhoun did not. And that was why my recommendation was, and the, actually I'm sure they knew they were gonna do this anyway, um, that he should go. Woodrow Wilson at Princeton, and I had nothing to do with that. I, was, I didn't talk to anybody there about this. Woodrow Wilson, Wilson to my mind was a more difficult proposition because Woodrow Wilson made modern Princeton. He turned it from a sleepy, you know, seminary type school to a first class institution. 
He was the president of Princeton. He was the president of the United States. This was a figure who was more connected to the place than John Calhoun. He was a figure who you know, made the place, as I said, and that was a more difficult question. At first, they decided you know, to keep the name, but after the Floyd situation, after the situation recently, uh, after the new reckoning on race, uh, they made another decision. So this shows you, it's an interesting thing for a historian to see this process happen in real time, for one decision to be made at one point and things happen, events happen. And this is the point about history that, we, that historians always stress is the nature of contingency. Nothing, has, nothing is inevitable. Nothing has to work the way uh, you, you think it's going to work out. It doesn't have to be that way. And this is, what, this is what history teaches us. We're in a tough situation right now. I, am, I have been criticized by some people for my stance on this question of separating Confederates out from members of the founding generation um, because the issue is not just fighting against the United States of America, it's the question of race relations. How can we go forward if we still honor people who did things in the past that were antithetical to our understanding of the way the races, races should relate to one another today? And this is something that, it's not a, it's not a trivial point. Integration, bringing people together is always going to create a situation where of, of change. You can't ask African-American people, or you can't expect, I should say, African-American people to come into institutions that were formerly white or to feel that they are definitely a part of the institutions of this country if you do not take their feelings into account, if you do not take their uh, the things that bother them, the things that are important to them into account. It's not just about bringing black people in and the organization, none of our understandings about things change. It's about making people truly, really and truly a part of the institution. So institutions, and that's not just for, goes for universities. It also goes for the country as a whole. Voting, all those kinds of things, it has to be, things have to change. When the country becomes really inclusive, there, have, there will in fact be things that don't, you know, don't remain the same, that you have to accommodate this new understanding and new understandings about the way the society should work. We're at a difficult juncture at this point, and people ask me what is going to happen as if historians can predict the future, and we can't. But I do believe that this reckoning that we're having now is really important. It looks at this time, I know I've had, had a number of conversations with friends who feel somewhat demoralized at this particular moment because they don't see the sort of backlash against, the, the sort of a backlash forming against the movements that have been put in place to try to bring about um, a change after this racial rec reckoning. But I'm not pessimistic about that. I'm actually optimistic that things will change because you actually have to go through this process, the process of struggle uh, to see something different come to place, come to pass. And I'm very much heartened by the involvement of young people in all of these questions. I've had many conversations with young people when I give talks in different places who feel that now is actually a time to make change, that they wanna be involved in all of this. They wanna be involved, not just in terms of protesting, but being involved in the electoral process and being a part of things in ways, and not just being a spectator, standing on the sidelines, looking inside, looking, looking at um, watching things go by rather than being a part of it. Uh, voting rights, the movement for voting rights, uh, the movement for, uh, to try to do something about policing. Um, there are all kinds of, I, I participated in a discussion last night 
Um, there are all kinds of views. People are now paying attention to things that they did not before. Uh, the question of policing in, in America is something that has galvanized individuals. This is one area where technology, I think, has made a difference for people to actually see these things, to see people who have been assaulted, see people, see police officers dealing with people in ways that are problematic. I teach criminal procedure and criminal procedure investigation, which is all about the Fourth Amendment and search and seizure and you know, search and seizure, Fifth Amendment rights and so forth. And in the scenarios, the stories that are told, in most of them, the officer has one version of the story and obviously the suspect has, and his lawyers have, a, his or her lawyers have different uh, version of it. And you're not able to see these just in the words, but now that we actually have videotapes of people, it has changed the way my students talk about these particular matters because you can see a gap between a presentation that might be made on paper and what actually happened. Now, now film doesn't settle everything, but it's a way into these matters that we didn't have before. Members of the black community for many, many years have talked about the way police officers have conducted themselves, um, the way they talk to black suspects, the way they talk to black people in general, and very often they weren't believed. They weren't believed in these situations, but now these videotapes, which in lots of ways are a double-edged sword because they are traumatic for many people. And some people say, all right, we've gotten the message now. We don't really need to see this over and over again. But I do think that they have been invaluable in making people see policing in a different light. And so a number of the young, my students, a num number of the young people that I talk to think about this in different ways. And anytime you think about thing in different, things in different ways, it's possible, I think, to move a community forward on that question. We don't have a precise answer uh, to, to these matters, and don't have a precise answer to how policing should be done, but I think it's useful to talk about these kinds of things. The bottom line for all of this is that we are the products of the past. The people who are controversial figures, Washington, Jefferson, those individuals who lived under a system of slavery, lived in a system where slavery was legal, racialized slavery, which gave people understandings about African-American people vis-a-vis -vis white people, we're still living with all of those things. And the difficult times that we're encountering right now are a product of all of those kinds of things. And my hope with all of this and my answer to all of this in dealing with problematic figures is that we contextualize them, that we explain how they figure in the American story, how they figure in the past and how what their actions continue to influence us today. Jefferson, in notes on the state of Virginia and some of his policies, did things that were helpful to the country, obviously, but there are also things, the legacies of that time period that we're still living with, this whole question about black citizenship, which is related to the issue of policing. You know, are, if blacks are 100% citizens or true citizens, they ought to be able to expect a certain kind of treatment, um, equal treatment, the kind of treatment that whites receive as well. But this is something that was the groundwork for all of this was laid during the time of slavery. And we have to recognize that. So my answer is that we contextualize these figures to the extent that we can when there are people who have made contributions to the country that are lasting, which I believe Jefferson has, but is a problematic figure in other ways, we take the bitter with the sweet. We take the good things that they did and recognize that, but we also tell people of the side that are, the sides of things that are problematic. The Jefferson Memorial in Washington, I think the, I visited for the first time, believe it or not, just a few years ago. And one of the things that's stark about it is to see his statue 
across the tidal basin facing Martin Luther King, who seems to be, in a way, if you look at it, questioning Jefferson and saying, look, you have made the, this promise. Remember in the, in the great speech that he gave in the March on Washington, saying that this is sort of a bill that had come due, the American Declaration of Independence. To see those figures face off in that way, to my mind, puts the American story in its starkest form. And without that kind, those kinds of confrontations, without the kind of contextualizing, which I actually believe is going on now at the Jefferson Memorial, we lose something important. And so my answer would be to a Jefferson, a Washington, not Calhoun. We could do without Calhoun. That was a, a, that was a branch of the river that went nowhere. You know, we, we did not accept the idea that African Americans were fit just to be enslaved. There's not much we can learn from him. But from Je that's not much that I should say of his legacy that should continue with us in a good way, because it's a legacy that is antithetical to where we want to go uh, as Americans, I believe. Those kinds of people, and we'll have arguments about this. People ask me if there's a precise, there's no precise formula for this, this situation, but we have to have dialogue about it and have a discussion about all of this to try to figure out who remains. Because I, I definitely think that you actually need figures of the past as, reminders of where we've been and reminders of how far we've come in those situations. And these are not people who have to be heroes in the sense that you are, you worship them or you think that they're perfect people because they were decidedly not perfect people, but they are people who, whose lives mean something or should mean something to us because they help put the country on the path that we have been on. They actually created it. And if you think that the United States of America was a worthy creation, you should know about the men and the women who helped put those, uh, helped put the country on the path, actually brought it into, cre into creation. I also think from my own work that this is not just a matter of talking about famous people, the most famous people that you're thinking about, it's their founders broaden their understanding of who the founders are thinking about ordinary people, not only soldiers who fought in the American Revolution, but other people who took the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and fought for them. When the Declaration became known, African Americans in Boston and in other places took the words of the Declaration to heart, whether Jefferson meant it for them or not. These are words that were universal truths that people tried, tried to live by and tried to make America live up to. So those people are founders as well. Mumbet, who filed a freedom suit and was victorious in, in Boston uh, during the revolutionary period. Other people who took American ideals and tried to make them real. Criticism, as other people have said, James Baldwin has said that you know, one of the, he actually loved America and he loved America enough to be able to criticize it. And I think that, is what I've tried to hold in my, in my mind and thinking as a, as a historian and writing about the past and writing about these people. It's not about hero worship. It's not about thinking that people are perfect. It's about understanding the contributions that people made, putting, putting them in context and understanding that they were human beings. They were human beings who I think did something that was worthwhile to, for the world it created a country that was not perfect. It created a constitution that was not perfect, that had to be made more perfect. And unfortunately, it took a war to make it more perfect, another war to make it more perfect, this American Civil War, and something that we've been fighting to try to bring into perfection every decade since then. This is an interesting time in the United States. Who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of months. But I am confident that people in this country who love this country will keep the faith and understand the importance of being able to move from one leader to the next leader in a peaceful way, 
without any kind of discord, without any kind of, well, serious discord. There's always discord in, in politics, but nothing serious that will help us go forward for the next century. And I think the discussion we're having right now, the reckoning that we're having right now about where we are is important to that process. I mean, we have to be able to disagree, to have different viewpoints, but to understand that we are Americans and that we care about this country and a legacy was given to us, not a perfect legacy, but one that we've been trying to perfect from the beginning. Troublesome people in, from the past, they are part of who we are and we should recognize that. So with that, I would like to take your questions, which as I said, is always the best part of these kinds of events. I think I'm back. I'm not sure what the, uh, the Zoom version of applause is, but let's all do it from wherever we are. <laughs> Fabulous. So um, we are gathering up a bunch of these questions and I'm, I think what I'll try to do is sort of um, you know, put a few together uh, that will cover you know, multiple folks asking some more things. So one of the, one of the, one theme that we've been getting uh, during the evening, and that is sort of reflecting back to your work as a historian. Um, was there a kind of eureka moment? Uh, Beverly asked when you decided, um, you know, the, the Hemings family, Thomas Jefferson was something you had to write a book about. And, um, and I guess I, I would, add to that, do you think that, um, how do you see sort of the work that you did and, and scholars in general as contributing to the moment that we're in and our ability to have the kind of dialogue, uh, civil and uncivil perhaps, that we're having? Uh... Well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> what the work that I did, how it contributed, I kind of think, it, ah, I think I might have created a problem for Jefferson. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I said when I was to myself, when I was working on the first book that, uh, I wondered if people accepted that this story was true, that he did have this connection to Sally Hemings and we could talk maybe later on about what that was. Um, would that make people let, you know, pretty much discard him. And for the most part, I don't think that that has that happened with many people but i do think i i've shaped positively and negatively the way people view jefferson um what made me do it the the epiphany was my concern that the words of madison hemmings and other enslaved people in the hemmings family was not being credited uh, I thought it was strange. I thought it was wrong, morally wrong, actually. It was a moral question to me uh, that the words of people who had been victims of slavery, and there was no question that these were victims. This is not like, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Jefferson did not think he was innocent. Mm. And I'm not talking about the Hemings thing, but I mean, as a slave owner, he did not think that he was innocent. In doing that, he knew that that was wrong. And people say, well, he must not have known it was wrong because he kept doing it, except that would be true if human beings always did what they knew was right. And we don't, <laughs> we don't, you know? And he knew that he was wrong. So it struck me as odd that historians would cast him and other slaveholders in the role of innocent people and say that the enslaved people were the ones who had to prove that something bad had happened to them. So that's, that's really what it was. It was not, oh, I want to prove Tom and Sally had some long, you know, connection or whatever. It was why, historians, why are you crediting, giving more credit to the words of enslaved enslavers over the people who were enslaved. So that's, that was the real epiphany for me. I wanted to investigate that. And, and actually to point that out, I mean, my first book was really, to my mind, creating a record. I wasn't really writing so much to the people of the time. Hmm. I wanted to say for future generations, if anybody should look at the book, here is, here is how we lived. This is the way people thought about 
at a particular moment in history, the way people thought about this particular problem. And I think it said something about the, the nature of, of the situation that Black people were in. Hmm. So I know um, a, lot, a lot of uh, another theme that we're getting a lot of questions is sort of about the present moment, about the role of historians in uh, kind of public discourse. Um, uh, I want, uh, everyone's heard of, if perhaps doesn't understand all the nuances of what this, the, the 1619 project, now there is, a, there is a 1776 commission. There's a lot, a lot of discussion about uh, history that- 1865 commission, who knows? <laughs> so, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, well, it's a question, I mean- uh, Yeah, I, I wonder if you could just sort of, uh, if you could, um, a, for those who maybe have seen the words but don't really know the nuances of what, what actually, what the 1619 Project has been. I know you oh, participated oh, oh. in at least one <coughs> panel discussion uh, and then, you know, the, the sort of uh, discussion that's going on right now. Well, right now, uh, the 1619 Project was a project that was designed to talk about the importance of slavery in the United States. Um, it became controversial because it had it made a claim say, suggesting, well, you might say that the United States was actually founded in 1619 um, instead of 1776, which of course are fighting words, uh, you know, and I think it was meant as a provocation uh, because it's obviously, that's crazy. I mean, not, I don't say that's not crazy, but it's not, there was no United States in 1619. And that back the, this point that I made about contingency, mm. 1619, the, the United States is not inevitable <laughs> at that point. Even you know, imaginable, but, perhaps. It, imaginable, <laughs> imaginable at this point. They would have said, you're America. I mean, you know, you're citizens of the United States. And they would have gone, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, they were subjects. They were English subjects dealing with African people who had been the first 20 had been people who'd been captured from the Spanish. <laughs> so th this is not in the making. So I think it became a controversial point because of, of a rhetorical flourish. But the basic idea that slavery, the institution of slavery is a big part of American history is essential to the early American Republic and all those things is true. You know, I mean, it, that was not needed. Uh, the point is actually there. So, yeah, I, I think that there's been a backlash against um, that and there's a presidential commission. I don't know, did he sign an executive order or something like that? I don't know who's on the commission or whatever, but uh, mm -hmm. people are trying to, it, and it goes back to what we're, what we're talking about. I was talking about before, about right now, people are trying to grapple with how do you handle the past? I mean, we like the stories about, um, you know, conquered. We like the stories about, you know, you know, George Washington and the cherry, we don't like that much, the cherry tree. They very much, but we like the image of it, but we have to deal with the realities that make things not totally pleasant. So I, I think that there's a, there's a tit for tat going on. <laughs> it's probably not gonna calm down anytime soon. I don't think so. So we have a, a number of people tuning in tonight who are either, um, uh, K through 12 educators or people, museum educators working in, mm -hmm. uh, in historic sites, some right across the street from where I'm sitting, including some of my own staff. And I'm, I'm curious in that if, if you have sort of uh, any suggestions, recommendations, reflections on sort of how to have these kinds of hard conversations, you know, with different audiences. I mean, it's one thing for, uh, you know, scholars uh, around the seminar table or public intellectuals, you know, writing uh, pieces, but, you know, so much of the way the nation is actually, uh, you know, engaging in these conversations is in, in places like, uh, like this in the classroom, and um, we love museums as well. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, well, it depends on the subject matter. If mm -hmm. it's about Jefferson, um, certainly Monticello has done a lot for teachers, has a lot of material for teachers to, to deal, you know, to, to help them talk about these kinds of subjects. Um, I think, I don't know, you know, 
I have talked to lots of different types of audiences. Mm -hmm. And I think what the key is respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of a generalized statement, but I have found that if you talk to people honestly and with a degree of respect, if you're willing to not cut people off when they express an opinion that's different mm. from yours or to see a difference as making that person your enemy in a way, mm. I think it's the spirit with which you engage in these conversations. Now with children, you know, if you talk about, children are very much into fairness. <laughs> and if you talk about, you know, the unfairness, thinking, of, get them to think about what it would be, how they would feel mm -hmm. in those situations. If you were in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you could be separated from your parents, uh, when you're made to work yourself as a child, and, and to do things that, you know, not being educated, not having the opportunities that they have. I mean, it, it's a, there's a way to do it. And I've seen a lot of teachers, and there's, there's a lot of material for that, for the, um, there's their books, children's books. That's what actually got me into history, reading a child's biography uh, about Jefferson and Monticello. Um, look for, and there are plenty of books about, you know, there's a book about the Hemings children written you know for young people those those are ways into it that i think that make people have the kind of empathy that is needed to work the, through these situations you're not talking about another species you're talking about other human beings and emphasizing that seems to work mm -hmm. uh a more specific question going back to uh the the mountaintop there outside charlottesville mm -hmm. a question about um you know, the degree to which you think the issue of personal debt, um, specifically for Jefferson, but of course, it, uh, you know, many of the people of Jefferson's class in this period, it sometimes said that that, that was a, a, an impossible barrier for considering emancipation. And how do you see that playing a role in, you know, in Jefferson's uh, relationship to that? that well, it played that some, it played some role. But Jefferson did not believe in individual emancipations. Mm -hmm. He thought that the society, Virginia, <laughs> the Virginians should come to the point where they realized that slavery was, he believed, making Virginia backwards and mm -hmm. would in fact legislatively get rid of this. Now, of course, that would take years and it would never, I mean, it, slavery went away the way it went away for war. But he could not have contemplated that. So I don't think that even if Jefferson, hmm. you know, financially could have done so, he couldn't have because he died in debt. And so that was out of the question. But say that he could, he, he thought that individual emancipations were just ways that individual people made themselves feel good. Hmm. It didn't solve the problem. Hmm. Uh, it, the problem, black, there should be a general emancipation. And so I, I don't think that the debt was not really the issue, even though realistically, I mean, he, he couldn't have freed them because the, you know, enslaved people were assets in the hands of the executors. They could in fact be sold to pay debts. Fabulous. So um, this is a, a question from Scarlett, who I recognize as a, as a great friend of Mount Vernon's and Monticello's and the Museum of the American Revolutions. Uh, is, a, is a master's student and uh, is asking about, ta uh, says he's about to tackle, uh, tackle analyzing the morality ideals controversy of the American Revolution for a thesis and is asking about how to avoid putting one's own bias uh, into historical analysis or is that even possible? Uh, well, Bernard Balin said that just because, and I'm paraphrasing him, the great historian, that just because you can't have 100% objectivity doesn't mean that you don't try for it. <laughs> <laughs> and the best, because you can't, I mean, you can only see things through your perspective. Mm -hmm. You try to check yourself. And I try to check myself by, you know, anytime I come to a point or something that bothers me that I'm looking at a, a bit of evidence, something bothers me. I have to stop and ask myself, why does that bother me? 
you know, what's, what stake do I have in this, you know, in this particular answer? Why am I fighting against it? And I think you have to be honest with yourself that we do have preferences, right? We do, you know, there are things you would rather this person didn't do this or didn't say that or whatever, but in fact, they did and you have to deal with it. So the best thing you can do, I think is to just constantly talk to yourself about it because you can't have 100% objectivity, but I do think you should try for it. I, I'm not with this idea where you just sort of say, well, because we can't, if it can't be perfect, then we just, we don't try. It's a constant battle. And sometimes you have to, you know, you test it against other people, run it by other folks. Uh, but mainly it's being honest with yourself. You know, I don't, I don't like this story. I don't like this part of it. And, but you got to do it. And one of the things that keeps you honest for me is I don't want anybody telling me something that I, that, I, you know what I mean? I don't want for me not seeing something for another person to come in and say, oh, didn't you notice? So it's the competitive part of it <laughs> to me that sort of says, it's like being a lawyer. I mean, everybody thinks, you know, I was trained as a lawyer and my first book came out and everybody said, well, you know, lawyers always put things, you know, just, just tell their side of the story. Bad lawyers tell only their side of the story. Good lawyers know the other side better than the other side mm. because that you can't, you have to. So the, the moment is getting to that moment where you're honest with yourself about mm. your evidence and honest with yourself about the other person so that you can deal with it. And it's the fear for me, it's the fear of being, having somebody come and say you're wrong, <laughs> that, which is worse, you know, so that's know where all the, know where all the holes are. In other exactly. Words. Exactly. You need to know that. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd love to shift to a sort of forward uh, reflecting question about the approaching 250th, uh, 2026. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, boy, our, we're starting to, you know, think. Big yeah, you guys here have got us. You can imagine, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, those conversations were a lot different six months ago than they are now. Uh, so it's evolving, obviously. That. Just curious, you know, what are you thinking about? What are your hopes, aspirations? Uh, you know, what, what do you think? Uh, how do you think that the nation's relationship to its revolutionary history might be different uh, in 2026 than it is now, or, well, or perhaps when we were living through the bicentennial. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I was in high school then, and I remember it as much more celebratory. Obviously, I think it's going to be celebratory mm -hmm. still, but I think it will be cel celebratory in a uh, mature is a value uh, laden word. I, I, I think. It, I think people are, I think people are going to be interested. People are interested in the real stories. You know, I, I don't, do you know what I mean? I, I think, I think there will be celebration, but I think that people are looking for a broader picture of this. They want to know, as I said, when I was talking in my talk about not just the great men, I think people want to know history from the bottom up as well. The great man will be there, but history from the bottom up will be a part of it as well. My hope for it is that we, we make it there intact. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, yeah. I do. I mean, I, you know, this is very, very hard for a historian of the early American Republic, this moment now, um, where every day you sort of wonder, is this going to work? And I, I think it will. I hope that it will. But that's what I'm hoping for is to get, that we get there, <laughs> we get past this moment and get there intact with the American Republic in place. From your lips to God's ears, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'm curious just in the field, because we, we have a number of people who are budding historians, you know, who are uh, starting degrees and a lot of questions about kind of fields of endeavor, you know, what, what, where's the exciting work happening? What work needs to be done? What are the uh, areas that you might direct um, uh, budding historians of, of the rising generation to mm -hmm. uh, you know, direct their efforts? Well, um, well, there are lots of things. I think political history um, is making a comeback, but political history 
that melds insights from social history together. It, it's putting things together instead of having, um, uh, you know, siloed uh, historical concentrations that you bring those two things together. I think globalization, I mean, I think bringing the American story, widening the American story. These people lived in a world of markets. Um, they traded with people across the Atlantic, uh, you know, North America, South America. I mean, I know this, from, well, Jefferson had his hand in everything. So he's, you know, dealing with people everywhere, writing to people everywhere. I think that you know, compar comparative slavery, I think, is interesting. Um, uh, we tend to think of these as separate systems and, and totally different, but slavery in the Caribbean and slavery in uh, Virginia, slavery in America, those are interesting points. Uh, uh, Karen Wolf, down at the Omaha Institute, talks about vast America. Uh, pulling these things together, you know, I'm writing, well, I mean, the West, but the Spanish West, uh, we sort of have America that's kind of <laughs> drifts off. And then California, something's going on out there during this time period. Bringing all these things together to see vast America as, as connected. I think that that's, that's going to be the, that's the thing that, that's going on right now and will continue. Not just a, a, na a narrow nationalist story. You, um, you started to answer a question that a number of people are interested in, which is what, what have you got cooking right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have something cooking right now that I can't talk about, but um, um, the main thing I have cooking is another volume of the Hemings family story. Mm. And I'm doing a Jefferson reader on race for poor Preston, uh, Princeton University Press. I am way overdue for that, <laughs> but it's just taking Jefferson's writings and uh, all in one spot, one in one place, and with commentary, sort of running commentary for me about all of them. So those are the, the two things that I'm working on right now. Volume of the Hemings family, keep it, taking them in the 19th century and the Civil War <clears throat> and dropping them off at the beginning of the 20th century for good. <laughs> you promise? <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I promise myself. Um, okay, I let me go back up here. Boy, it's so hard to get everybody in. Um, uh, Alan, uh, Nathan had asked uh, about your interactions with Bernard Balin since you brought him up earlier, just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much were you able to, uh, over time, you know, interact with this legend of American history? <laughs> Not a lot. I mean, I met him at a couple of conferences. I met him first at an Omaha concert uh, uh, conference uh, down in Williamsburg about the Atlantic slave trade. That's the first time I met him. And the next time I spent any time with him was after I came to Harvard, we had lunch. So I don't, I don't have <laughs> extensive, uh, extensive um, contact with him, but uh, an incredible figure, a towering figure in, in American history. Fantastic. Um, let me scroll here. I have a number of people who've, who've just asked about um, uh, the DNA research related to Sally Hemings and, mm -hmm. you know, is there, is, is there a, is there a latest, latest uh, summary of, of, uh, of that research and uh, where, where all of this has landed? Well, um, there's nothing more. I think they, you know, there'd been some years ago, a second, you know, go at all of it that was more confirmatory than the first go around at it. But nothing else that I that I know of. I, I suppose that there are some things in the work, but nothing that has been announced. Gotcha. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I can't tell you uh, how honored we are to have you back. Of course, you and mm -hmm. Peter Onuf, my old grad school advisor from UVA, uh, were here. Oh, really? I'd, I'd I forgotten guess it was that. in 2018. Yeah, we were. Uh, he was he was coming as I was uh, departing, uh, finishing up. But we managed to get a few classes together, and uh, yeah, so it was great to have you and Peter here. I guess that was two years ago, mm -hmm. and, um, and we really look forward to having you back to the museum uh, here in Philadelphia. And uh, thanks to all of the 
I think at one point we were we were hitting about 600 of our mm -hmm. thousand pre-registered folks here. So mm -hmm. great attendance tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, I wish uh, wish we could handle more of the questions, but we want to honor everybody's dinner reservations. Oh, that's right. Nobody <laughs> goes out anymore. Uh, what dinner reservations? What? <laughs> but we are recording. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this will be available. Uh, we'll be, you know, posting this uh, on the website. So you'll, you'll be able to share this, uh, go back and watch. And thank you all so much for joining us for the Carl Buchholz lecture. Annette Gordon-Reed, thank you uh, once again. You're a, you're a national treasure, no doubt about it. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to what you guys are going to do for the 250. Very good. Stay tuned. Okay. Thanks. Good night. Good night.